Hello and welcome to the very first Crypto Professor critique of the news. I'm going to start choosing selected articles and news stories with which to offer my opinion on what the news is saying in the hope to disseminate a little bit of critical thinking and fact around the fear, uncertainty and doubt or indeed euphoria of trading cryptocurrencies to try and poke holes in the conspiracy theories and ideas that aren't really holding water anymore and also when we have massive market movements to inject a little bit of consternation I suppose and basically keep everything on even keel. Today I am looking at the tweets and articles of Paul Krugman who is a very well respected uh, economist author of 27 books over 200 articles um, and a huge cryptocurrency skeptic so i'm going to be examining his publications and going over basically his opinion regarding cryptocurrencies now i should say first and foremost i am not looking to attack anyone in this video in any of these videos I am literally just trying to understand the perspective of someone else and framing their arguments in the way that I see it, okay? Now, I'm not saying I'm right and Paul is wrong. I'm not saying Paul is right and I am wrong. But what I'm trying to do is trying to find some discourse and also to demonstrate how some of the ideas are, one, a little bit out of date and two, could do with a little bit of extra explaining um, and also can be quoted out of context, which can cause more fear, uncertainty and doubt, particularly in times like this. If you're watching this video in the future, we've just had one of the biggest Bitcoin drops, 50% in the space of a couple of days, and that has caused massive market uncertainty. Um, and it's news stories and opinion pieces by individuals like Paul who ultimately contribute to that fear, uncertainty and doubt. So without further ado, let's look at the most recent article that appeared 15 hours ago. And the headline from The Independent in the UK is Nobel Prize winning economist gives damning warning on Bitcoin. It's a cult that can survive indefinitely. OK. So it's a negative news story framed in a kind of positive light. Um, and, you know, it's obviously got the idea of a Nobel Prize winning economist. Um, it does explain further on in the article what the Nobel Prize was for, which was in international trade relations. It's not specifically related to cryptocurrencies and was awarded in 2008 for earlier work. So it actually predates the world of cryptocurrencies. So I'm... I'm curious about the use of Nobel Prize winning there just because obviously, yes, it demonstrates that Paul is an intelligent person, but you could know that if you just Wikipedia'd him and read some of his other writings. But it's kind of being used to say this person is probably right because of the halo effect, the psychological fact that people who accrue uh, many qualifications in their life or have levels of esteem, their opinion tends to factor weight behind other areas that they know less about okay so um that's what i'm doing there in his recent tweets he said while bitcoin has been around since 2009 nobody seems to have found any good legal use for it okay now that's a little bit of a misnomer because there is now a huge industry around cryptocurrencies crypto companies are everywhere there are now trading firms, there are now DeFi protocols, there are now companies like Nexo, Celsius, Crypto.com, Binance, etc. The entire cryptocurrency market is now no longer a nascent small enterprise. And it's not just the idea of spending cryptocurrency either. You know, it's generating thousands and thousands of tax dollars or tax pounds uh, for various governments around the world and that's why the governments aren't really clamping down on it. Turkey obviously tried to recently but then when there was a backlash two weeks later they said they were regulating it as opposed to anything else. India has just done the same thing. Um, they said they were going to ban it and then they backtracked extremely quickly because they realised that there are now 
millions of jobs resting on this industry okay so the fact I, I take issue with the fact that Paul is claiming that no one seems to have found any good legal use for it I also take fact in the idea that um, there's a statistic that says that 99.5 percent of Bitcoin transactions in 2020 were f not directly the result of criminal activity so they weren't actually being used for criminal activity the idea that Bitcoin is used for criminal activity is really, really old and kind of a little bit annoying when you consider that the main avenue of criminal payments throughout the world has been the US dollar and will continue to be the US dollar. If you have US dollars on you now, there's a quite a strong possibility that they have traces of cocaine on them purely because they've been used in cocaine transactions. But that's another point entirely. Bitcoin cryptocurrencies is not a convenient medium of exchange it's not a stable store of value it's definitely not a unit of account this is the elephant problem effectively okay how do you label an elephant okay it's got four legs is it a dog no okay it's got a tail is it a cat no it's got a trunk oh nothing else really has a trunk maybe a giraffe has a long neck and that's similar to trunk i don't know the point is from a perspective of labeling and calling something something bitcoin is trying to be too many things okay it does all of these things it is a medium of exchange you can send bitcoin to other people in a very efficient way um and you know compared with the modern banking world there was a ripple advertisement a few years ago in 2018 where they said and demonstrated it was actually easier to fly a briefcase of money around the world than to send it via a traditional bank and the energy use to get on that bandwagon that people have been recently talking about is about the same as well so obviously flying a briefcase of money is nowhere near as uh, poor or environmentally unfriendly as a bitcoin bitcoin transaction okay bitcoin transaction actually comes out better especially the longer that bitcoin is around it is not a stable store of value if anything a couple of days ago three four weeks ago anyone who'd ever bought bitcoin in the history of it trading would have made money the only people who would have lost money would if would have been if they'd taken profits earlier than three or four weeks ago or they'd sold out at a loss due to fear okay that's a pretty reliable stable store of value okay it's not stable okay it's systematically growing in value but that's what you ideally want from a store of value but the idea is that if you'd bought bitcoin at any point in the last 10 years three weeks ago up until three weeks ago you would have made money and that will continue for the foreseeable future until bitcoin hits six seven figures potentially okay and there will be a clearly delineated point where it reaches its maximum unit of cost okay and it's definitely not a unit of account it's not a unit of account in dollar terms because that's the very thing that it's going against but it is a unit of account in satoshi so if you're trading bitcoin you might be collecting satoshi as opposed to collecting dollars okay it's a great unit of account if you want to trade in satoshi because you're collecting un smaller units of bitcoin okay but obviously it doesn't really make sense if you're doing that in something that's fluctuating all over the place because it's such a new technology and because it's ultimately fighting a losing currency the dollar is a losing currency and that's what's built into it over time it loses two percent of its value every year systematically without fail he goes on to continue but i've given up predicting imminent demise there always seems to be a new crop of believers well i don't think that's completely true i'm certainly not a new believer okay but i haven't lost faith in bitcoin despite the recent drop okay what i think is happening is actually more people are coming on board and are switching to the new way of thinking most recently in 2021 it's been companies that have been looking to hedge their balance sheets against inflation and the best way they found of doing that is actually buying bitcoin despite its volatility elon musk buying tesla 1.5 billion dollars worth of bitcoin that was in profit it is no longer but he's still holding because he firmly believes that in time 
it will appreciate in value still. And, you know, we have not seen the all time high forever for Bitcoin at $64,000. It will climb higher than that in due course. So the idea of a cult for crypto is kind of a little bit of a joke, um, purely because um, there are now 46 million Americans who own Bitcoin. Generally, it's around about 10 to 15 percent of each country who actually own Bitcoin. That is a large cult that would make it more popular than pretty much any religion. Um, and, you know, worldwide, it would be one of the largest religions if Bitcoin were a religion. Now, I'm not saying, please don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying that Bitcoin is a religion or even cryptocurrencies are a religion. I'm just demonstrating the fact that if you want to call Bitcoin some kind of faith, um, you know, it obviously does take faith to hodl and hold it for a long period of time, then it would be an extremely popular um, w way of living, basically, or a belief system. OK, so to call it a cult implies that it's a small number of people um, who, you know, are ultimately wrong uh, and they will be proven wrong in time or, you know, they'll consistently be wrong. Um, and I think the word cults is misused there. OK. Now we're going back to a 2018 uh, column that I will analyze in a moment. So I'm actually going to switch over to that one first so we can actually have a look at that. And this is called Transaction Costs and Tethers, Why I'm a Crypto Skeptic. And it was, it was obviously pub published back in July 2018 during a bear market. So this type of writing was lapped up by media companies uh, all over the place because it suited the narrative of the market at the time and it was easily um, clicked on. So they got their uh, quota of attention from news articles like this. This was probably when most people were doing most of the damage to their portfolio because they exited the market uh, because they no longer had faith that the market was going to return their uh, value. OK, so if you look at the broad sweep of monetary history, there has been a clear direction of change over time, namely one of reducing the frictions of doing business and the amount of real resources required to do those frictions. And he goes on to argue that gold and silver were some form of this, then banknotes uh, replaced coinage, etc. And his central argument is that cryptocurrencies don't provide this. OK, he actually goes on to say that cryptocurrencies wipe out 300 years of fiat currency development. Um, I would say that's true. And I would say that's true because uh, they are better. OK, they don't rely on belief. Well, they do rely on belief, but they don't rely on belief of, the, of a government. OK, they rely on the belief of users that they are going to be useful in the future. OK, and if you think about it, that's the way that most fiat currency works. OK, I believe that a pound is worth a pound because I used it yesterday and I trust that because I used it yesterday consistently enough I will be able to use it tomorrow similarly with the dollar okay whenever we go on holiday and we go to a different country we always get a slightly weird feeling I think of talking to friends and family about using that other currency because we have to peg it artificially against our own in order to understand what it's worth okay um, you know you, you're not used to trading in another currency and you therefore have to think about it in terms of your original currency OK, um, or the currency you use on the most frequent basis. Uh, he then goes on to say that governments and banks are worth trusting. Um, and for the most part, governments and central banks exercise restraint. OK, well, I wouldn't say that's necessarily true. OK, um, in the last obviously year or so due to COVID, the Federal Reserve in the United States, which I'm using because it's the reserve currency of the world um, dollars are by far the most used currency on earth um, the federal reserve actually printed uh, over well four trillion dollars in the space of a year in actual fact uh, almost a fifth of all dollars were printed in 2020 now you might say that that's a slightly straw man argument because obviously we're in a pandemic and it wasn't normal but if we look back since 2008 we can see that actually the amount of money printing that happened during a time of relative prosperity that we can look back now and, and see, you know, prices were increasing, the S&P 500 uh, climbed 
through most of this period without fail okay but even then they were still printing four and a half trillion dollars in a matter of you know five years or so okay now that peaked and stayed still and stopped for a period of time and even tailed off a little bit and then suddenly COVID-19 hits okay so what that basically boils down to is in the past 12 years there have been over seven trillion dollars added to the monetary system and that is not sustainable in any way shape or form so here is the claim that we're using cutting edge technology to set the monetary system back 300 years but that's because it doesn't work that's because in the history of every fiat currency that has ever existed, they have always dropped to zero value. They have always hyperinflated. Right now, around the world, there are between 15 and 20 currencies with plus 10% inflation. Okay, What that means is the price of every good and service that you purchase in that currency increases by 10% every year. Okay, In order to keep that sane, wage growth needs to keep up with that okay and what business do you think is going to be paying their employees in real terms 10 percent more each and every year it's not going to happen okay then he goes on to argue the purchasing power of a dollar a year from now is highly predictable yes it's two percent lower than where it was this year and orders of magnitude more predictable than that of bitcoin well interestingly what i've just said is that if you'd bought bitcoin any time in the last 10 years and not worried about it and just kind of left it uh, to the side you would have been profitable ultimately okay the same is exactly the opposite of a dollar if you'd have owned dollars any time in the last 10 years and just put them under a mattress or had them in a safe at home they obviously are now still worth dollars but the prices that they are being used to buy would have increased so five thousand dollars from for instance could only buy four thousand dollars worth of goods and services in 2020 where maybe it could have bought five thousand in 2013 for example using a bank account means trusting a bank and by and large banks justify that trust well a recent uh, survey found 66% of adults in Britain do not trust banks to work in the best interest of society. Now, we don't really need to go back to the 2008 financial crash, but Lehman Brothers, Northern Rock in the UK, you know, they took people's savings and investments, pensions, mortgages, and they disappeared in a puff of smoke. And when people tried to get their money out of their bank accounts, they were told it didn't exist due to something called fractional reserve banking where a bank can lend out to retail investors retail uh, businesses um, nine times what they have on their balance sheets okay and this is something that's been going on for years so i take issue with the idea that the public trusts banks okay there might be a begrudging trust because there's no viable alternative for the majority of things but that might be starting to change with cryptocurrencies becoming more and more mainstream so then we scroll down a little bit further we have another reference to the idea of bitcoin being used to buy drugs and subvert elections and other criminal activity um, no mention of the fact that dollars um, do that as well there actually is a, a mention of it higher up with higher denomination dollars uh, 50 and 100 dollar bills actually so i do take that back slightly um, but by and large the the magnifying glass is definitely on bitcoin despite there being a lot more evidence that dollars are used for criminal activity than bitcoin okay in normal life people don't worry about where the value of green pieces of paper bearing portraits of dead presidents come from well maybe they should we accept dollar notes because other people would accept dollar notes. Now, this is probably the biggest statement of the entire thing. US government will accept dollars as payment of tax liabilities. Liabilities is able to enforce because it's a government. If you like fiat currencies, have underlying value because men with guns say they do. Now, that if that's not a tautology that is being critiqued frequently towards Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, I don't know what else is. Okay. The idea that a dollar has value because the government says it has value and not only that if it didn't they would come at you with violence 
surely can't really speak to a system that actually has a fundamental basis in logic. Um, and I am slightly alarmed at the level of cognitive dissonance within this article because Paul doesn't seem to have picked up on the fact that the very critique that is levelling at Bitcoin, i.e. that it doesn't have value or it doesn't have underlying value, is just a case of the fact that the government hasn't adopted it yet to pay tax. There have been numerous news stories around the world of Bitcoin being able to be settled in tax or settled tax liabilities, but they are usually quickly withdrawn or they, you know, they're just gaining headlines basically i don't think there's anywhere in the world at the present moment maybe you can alert me in the comments if i have missed something where you can actually settle your uh, tax liabilities with bitcoin okay so he goes on then to express the same idea with gold and then again if speculators were to have a collective moment of doubt, suddenly fearing that bitcoins were worthless, well, bitcoins would become worthless. The same with the dollar. If tomorrow, suddenly, the price of the dollar against any other cryptocurrency or any other currency, in fact, you know, doubled or tripled or halved, there will be extreme doubts. Look what happened in March 2020. Suddenly, the US dollar was very, very favourable because nowhere looked safe because of the COVID pandemic. The value of the dollar against other currencies uh, went to pretty much all-time highs one dollar uh, 14 in the uk okay so that's one pound to one dollar 14 effectively that's a very very low rate of exchange um, it's now currently around about one dollar 40 okay so that's a t good 25 percent swing effectively so that's what happened in march of 2020 when coronavirus suddenly hit and everyone t had doubts about most markets is they wanted to have the dollar and they didn't want to have anything else okay the same could happen again and if suddenly the dollar looked very scary and very weak and fluctuated in value by a significant margin that was outside the realm of normality people would rush into what's known as safe haven assets gold usually property and uh, now cryptocurrencies a certain amount would invest in cryptocurrencies okay but the idea that every single person who owns Bitcoin is suddenly going to have a doubt of it going to zero is slightly ridiculous. In actual fact, I would say that there are probably more people out there who now expect the US dollar to collapse to zero than there are people who expect Bitcoin to collapse to zero. Because if, as has been uh, demonstrated recently, if there are a sudden massive drop in Bitcoin, there are, as Paul identifies, a cult of individuals, i.e., uh, people who want to buy Bitcoin for cheaper and now companies are getting involved in that as well who will jump in and buy so if the price of Bitcoin dropped to $100 tomorrow and did a massive decline there are many people out there who would just push the price back up again and because it's a fixed asset because it has a ceiling in the number of units it offers it will climb higher okay and that equilibrium, if you like, is just part and parcel of the growth of the average price of Bitcoin over the last 10 years. If you look at an average price, it's been systematically increasing by around about $60 every single day. Whereas if you look at the dollar, it's been systematically declining by less than half a cent, probably a day on average. OK, uh, out of $100, that is OK. So Paul ends the article relatively nicely, okay, admits he could be wrong, okay, which is a nice thing to hear from a cryptocurrency sceptic because usually they are very convinced they are right in the same way that a crypto enthusiast is very convinced that they are right, okay. But he asks the question, he opens the question, what problem does cryptocurrency solve? Now, I know that most of my audience are going to be going, well, they, you know, you can send money without using a bank. Um, you can send money internationally without having to pay fees or extortionate fees. That is, you know, if I wanted to send, if I'm a crypto millionaire, I want to send a million pounds somewhere in the world, maybe to buy a property. Um, if I used a bank, it would cost me maybe three, four percent of the transaction. Where with Bitcoin, I could send it for the price of a pizza, 
basically okay so for large transactions it does solve that problem for small transactions you can use a different cryptocurrency maybe xrp maybe neo maybe something along those lines um stellar or something like that the point is there are numerous cryptocurrencies out there with different features and different properties and if you're just looking at crypto as bitcoin you're missing most of the market okay I'd actually like to go off on a little bit of a tangent here and talk about Ethereum Classic and Ethereum, okay? And put another idea in your head about what problems cryptocurrencies solved. Now, ever so often, there is a, frankly, I find amusing story about banks uh, messing up and sending huge amounts of money to people that don't deserve it or people it doesn't belong to. Uh, Deutsche Bank sent 28 billion euros, would you believe, um, to one of its outside accounts. Um, most recently, hit the headlines, um, Citigroup sent almost $900 million to a company, and the company refused to send the money back. And it had to go to court and cost Citigroup around about $500 million. Okay. So in these circumstances, what we have to do is rely on trust, okay? The banks suddenly find that the trust element of transactions isn't ideally what they would want, okay? Uh, we have to deal with this on a daily basis. You know, if you send money to another person in the UK and you get the details wrong and the uh, money goes into that other person's bank and they refuse to send it back to them, that's it. You've lost your money. Okay, the bank may reinstate you out of its insurance, but by and large, the person will have a windfall. Um, and depending on how honest they are and how much they want to keep it, um, they can do. And it's within the law for them to do that. Okay. With cryptocurrency, something really interesting happens because one of Paul's um, biggest uh, bugbears is the idea that cryptocurrencies are inefficient because you have to use the entire trading history in order to send it through okay in order to send the cryptocurrency through okay now that's blockchain technology for you and yes it is a severe limitation of cryptocurrencies and there are numerous solutions at work at the moment, sharding, for example, um, consensus without having to use the entire blockchain history, for example, certain touch points within the blockchain history where the consensus can be confirmed and therefore you don't actually have to use the entire history of the blockchain. OK, but yes, if you're looking at Bitcoin and you're thinking, hmm, how efficient is it? Not very efficient at all in terms of what it could be with a, with a number of small tweaks. And obviously, this is a point of contention with the Bitcoin community at large because um, there are different opinions on what should be going on. The point I'm trying to make is that history is actually a feature rather than a bug. And I'm going to use Ethereum Classic to explain this. OK, so back in... Uh, 2015, 2016, um, there was a hack of Ether, of the Ethereum network, for $50 million. Okay. And at the time, there were numerous solutions to this. Now, one of the solutions was actually enacted in that the blockchain was rolled back to make the $50 million worth of Ether completely uh, worthless, okay? So effectively, what they were able to do at block number 1,920,000 was fork the cryptocurrency into a different cryptocurrency, which ultimately became Ethereum Classic, and continue as if the hack had never occurred so effectively they were able to time travel and reverse a hack and reverse a attack on the network okay now ethereum classic continues to this day and it is trading a lot less than its brother ethereum okay ethereum recently hit a high of four thousand dollars ethereum classic i believe is at or is struggling to break uh, four figures, so a thousand dollars. Okay, um, so yeah, effectively, 
this system enables transactions to be reversed if they are nebulous, if they are dubious. Okay, so in this situation, if the banks have been using cryptocurrencies, they could have stopped the blockchain, reversed it, restarted it, and either made the tokens, the currency, worthless that was transferred and therefore get their money back, or they could just continue uh, the transactions as if they never happened. Okay, the point is that blockchain technology solves more problems than it starts. Okay. Ethereum is now one of the most efficient cryptocurrencies going. There are obviously more efficient cryptocurrencies out there, okay? But compared to Bitcoin, it's a lot more efficient than Bitcoin itself. But the idea that, you know, cryptocurrencies have no purpose and have no uh, value and don't really solve any economic problems, um, you know, that's one problem that theoretically could be worth a lot to banks and institutions and even individuals if something were to go wrong okay imagine the type of uh, problems that could be solved if every financial crime could be reversed and the stolen assets be completely eradicated okay not even in touch with them so that so they can do it at a distance okay so if someone stole you know 500 ether from you okay you could get the community to vote that that was a dubious transaction and the cryptocurrency network could block those transactions maybe there's a sharding process here where it's not necessarily the entire blockchain but uh, a part of the blockchain that you're working with uh, rolls back and those assets cease to be valuable because it's the consensus at the end of the day, the matching up of different cryptocurrency nodes that makes the cryptocurrency worth something. OK, so I hope you've enjoyed this critique of uh, Paul Krugerman's work on cryptocurrencies. I am going to finish just with uh, an opinion piece that he did very, very early in uh, December 2013, saying Bitcoin is evil, um, which I very much doubt okay yes certainly it's been used a little bit in the past but nowhere near as much as a dollar and that's the same as saying a dollar is evil okay why are you applying something uh, a a trait uh, a character trait to something as odd as bitcoin or as nebulous or as you know use an incorrect term here but ethereal i suppose as bitcoin bitcoin doesn't have positive or negative associated with it it's just a tool it is to not use Paul Krugman's phrase, an exchange of value. That is literally what uh, Bitcoin is. Okay, and obviously this opinion piece is now very old. And I don't think many people this day and age would actually say that Bitcoin is evil, but it certainly garnered the attention of fear, uncertainty, and doubt spreaders at the time. I hope you've uh, enjoyed this uh, short opinion piece. I plan to do more when I see worthy pieces of news that really kind of wind me up and make me think, hmm, I wish I had a platform with which to refute some of these claims and make people think about what they are reading as opposed to just digesting it and going, oh, I won't invest in cryptocurrencies or maybe I'll sell my cryptocurrency because this person of influence is saying that it's not a good idea. Now, I'm not going to say that Paul Krugman doesn't have some points, okay? There are certainly things worth thinking about in terms of the grand adoption of cryptocurrencies. Yes, there is, in my opinion, a little bit too much of a learning curve to crypto, okay? But that's something because it's such a wide-ranging and exciting new area of development that many people are just coming on board with. But as we saw earlier in this video, there are now many, many, many more people who are interested and actually own cryptocurrency. In actual fact, there's the most people who have ever owned cryptocurrency this year. So therefore, it's really worth exploring and understanding why people might be saying what they're saying and also how to think critically about what people might be saying in order to make the best investment decisions. Apart from that, happy trading.